Drew Nab here, and today we're going to talk about hubs, bearings, and bushings. We're going to start discussing the loads that actually go through your bearings, and those are generated from the wheel and the tire. So your primary force is the lateral force, which acts on the center of the bearing and the hub, pushing inward or pulling outward. You also will have a moment, a, a bending force that goes through the hub and bearings, and that's created from the fact that the lateral force is acts down here rather than acting on the center of the hub and on cars that run lots of camber that can also create a moment that tries to bend the hub and the bearings top to bottom. There's another moment that goes into the hub and bearings and that's from toe. That goes left to right and on cars that do not steer that particular axle like the back of this front wheel drive car you actually still create moments in this axis because the lateral force is not necessarily in the middle of the wheel and hub. And so those forces and moments are the inputs into your hubs and bearings and that's why hubs and bearings are important. Another thing to consider on your champ car, wheel offset relative to the hub face. As you move the center of the rim further outboard, you're going to increase the bending moment that has to be absorbed through the hub and bearing. This can lead to bearing failure because although the lateral force has stayed the same, increasing the bending moment can drive the hub and bearings beyond their rate of capacity. Hub failure modes. So the two common failure modes for hubs that you see in our series are either flange failure where you actually break off the flange that has the studs in it from the center of the hub or bearing bore failure where the bore receiver that holds the bearing in it actually fails and you either break it off or if you have a bearing that has two elements in it, the two elements will misalign and fail the bearings internally. So both of these issues can be caused from either manufacturing defects, the way the hub is actually made, or in some cases you actually will have different specs that the hubs are built to. I run into this with the Neons. Buying hubs from different vendors can actually result in different thicknesses, different radii on the back side and the front side, which can influence the strength dramatically. You can also have issues with material quality depending upon where you buy your hubs. And if OEM hubs are available, those are always a great option. You can also do research and buy a couple models from a vendor like Rock Auto Look for the best part, return the rest. Typical replacement intervals for the hubs that I've found is between two and four races depending on what kind of car you race. I personally always replace hubs every time I replace bearings. On some models of vehicles, it's very difficult to actually replace the bearings independent of the hub. But either way, it's often cheap insurance to just go ahead and replace the hub with a hub that you know works for your vehicle. I always buy the same brand name parts from the same places for my bearings and hubs for just that reason. Bearings. The bearings see the same load as the hubs. And like we talked about before, bearings have to survive both axial loads, the loads that are pushing in the center from the lateral force, and bending loads from toe steering and from camber. There are several kinds of bearings that will be in champ cars that we see. This one right here, this is a deep contact bearing. So in this style, there are balls that are in here that ride in a groove. This happens to have two rows of those. And those deep groove ball bearings are generally cheaper and easier to make. Most are sealed, meaning that, that, that there's no way to get extra grease in there and the grease also cannot escape so there's no requirement for another seal externally and usually they're, they're often easier to find because this is what most new OEM cars use. Alternatively some older cars and, and many performance cars used roller element bearings. So these look kind of like bigger versions of the needle bearings and these cylinders roll between this race and an inner race and often come in pairs for an inside and outside bearing. 
Now the advantage of this bearing over a deep groove bearing is that these bearings can handle larger axial load and sometimes can large, handle larger moments. They're more difficult to service, more expensive because there are two separate bearings to replace, and often require separate external seals. But of the two designs, this is the more robust. So bearing lubrication, what do you put in your bearings? Well, if you have the seal bearing type, like most cars that have deep groove bearings with integral seals, they come pre-lubed. Now, you can actually change the lube out yourself. There is a procedure, if you look online, to remove the seal here, grease them, and then push the seal back in. But it is difficult to do, especially if you're new. I generally leave them alone. On cars that are particularly prone to bearing failure, I would run a better grease. And there are aftermarket greases from Redline um, and other vendors that provide greater thermal range that they will operate in. Most greases will actually become runny and run out at really high elevated temperatures. These greases offer a higher maximum temperature that they can withstand without turning into liquid. So another consideration for bearings. All bearings have a max speed that they can be rotated at and a max speed that they can survive sustained loads at. Unfortunately for most cars, you're stuck with whatever bearing the car came with. But if you're doing a spindle swap and a hub swap, um, in the neon world, for example, this is known as the PT swap, where they take ST4 or PT Cruiser hubs and bearings and knuckles and swap them over. But part of that swap is to actually change the bearing size. And to reduce or, or change the critical speed that the bearing can be rotated at, you need to change the actual speed that the elements roll at inside the bearing. Another concern for bearings is bearing heat. Your bearings will actually absorb heat through the hub that comes from your braking system. This can come from your rotor size being too small or your cooling being insufficient for the brakes. But if you're having bearing failures, and especially if your wheel bearing grease is black and really burnt post-race, you may want to consider upsizing your brakes and or adding brake cooling to get your bearing temps down. Another thing that will drive the bearing temps up is the actual bearing speed. And each bearing has a maximum speed that it can be exposed to and still survive the wheel loads that are present on a race car. For most of us, we can't really change our bearing sizes, so this isn't much of a concern. But in general, you'll see bigger bearings on cars from a diameter standpoint to handle bigger loads. Smaller bearings can handle higher speeds better. So it's a consideration if you're swapping to a different hub, knuckle, and bearing package that you pick one appropriate to the vehicle speed you intend to go to. Wheel bearings that are sealed like this one do not have an external adjustment for bearing preload. You simply torque down the nut in your CV or axle stub and keep on going. An important consideration though is if you ever lose that bearing preload, the bearings will wear very quickly and fail. On bearing types where you can adjust the preload, like these angular roller bearings, it's important to read the manual, understand how to set bearing preload for your particular car, and in general, slightly adding preload will reduce camera compliance, running a little, little bit less preload can extend bearing life if you're having problems with failures. So make sure to not set those bearings too tight and to check them consistently. Bearing failures from hitting stuff. It all happens, we all do it. A lot of people neglect how much you will damage the bearing from curb hits, strikes against other cars. So it's important to always check and replace the bearings if you notice that the alignment is out or if your rim has significant contact and damage. And the reason why is because these rollers, even though they appear round, those can actually dent the race. And especially on a really hard, quick, sudden impact. Once you put a dent in the race, the bearing will just continuously keep on rubbing that dent and wear down the rollers. And no matter how much grease you have in it, no matter what other precautions and care you took, you will 
lose bearing preload from wearing the rollers away and you either have tons of camera compliance or you'll fare a bearing eventually. A great way to test for bearing failure is to measure the runout. Measure the runout on the car. Either you can measure it against the hub face itself or bolt a rotor down to it firmly and then get a dial indicator and rotate the rotor and or hub measuring runout. Look at the specs for your particular car, but in general I would expect the runout to be no more than 20 thousandths of an inch. Another reason why you should constantly check your bearings and replace them is camber loss and toe loss that you experience through bearing wear. So as your bearings wear and lose their preload, you will actually have more camber loss or camber change as you're driving on track. You can also have toe changes as you're driving on track. At times these can get to be really excessive, especially if you have a ton of bearing runout. So one of the ways to check without a runout gauge for bearing wear is on the car with the wheels off the ground at the 12 o'clock and 6 o'clock position try to rock the wheel and see if you can actually feel displacement of the rim itself without the car or the suspension moving. You can also do that in the steer direction, measure for toe change, but in general I found that's pretty hard to do because it's also easy to move the other wheel. So you need to make sure you stay on top of your bearing maintenance, check it with either the wheel method or the run out method and replace your bearings on a regular interval according to whatever schedule works for you. If you're in doubt, stick to the two to four race replacement schedule and use quality parts. Bushings and joints. First thing I'm going to cover is ball joints and you'll find ball joints on the front suspension and some rear suspension of cars we race. You also will find tie rods which are mechanically almost equal equivalent in their geometry and layout. You can also order tie rods or ball joints in varying heights. These two tie rods have a different height. That height comes from a difference between the bottom of the taper and the center of the tie rod. You can use that to change the location of the tie rod in the knuckle or in ball joints you can use it to actually create a taller knuckle. You can find these again, many aftermarket sources, very common in circle track racing. If you're doing a swap on your car, there are two very, very common ball joint tapers. And if you're ordering ball joints that are not OEM specific to your vehicle, it's important to know which of the two tapers you have. This is actually a reamer that can be used to machine a ball joint, a ball joint taper. This ball joint on the Neon actually has no taper. For tapered ball joints, they're typically 7 and 10 degree tapers. You can find ball joints or links that have either taper in a lot of aftermarket part suppliers, typically for circle track racing. You can also sometimes look up online at Rock Auto and it will list which of the two tapers you have for a particular ball joint you want to use in your car. You can also convert from one taper to another, but it's important to remember that as you run this taper further deeper in, the ball joint will also run deeper in, and that can be a concern for changing your geometry. Sealed or unsealed joints. This is a unsealed tie rod. It's intended to be run with no boot on the outside, and you have to consistently refill them with grease to push out contaminants. If I was running a unsealed versus sealed ball joint, I would replace them roughly every season. You can test your tie rods and ball joints using the method we spoke about before with them off the car looking for missing boots or excessive play and slop in the joint itself. Or just like the bearing and hub test, you can do them on the car by lifting the car up, moving the hub, and looking for play. You're going to have to have somebody else watch this because it's very hard to distinguish between hub and bearing play and actual tie rod or ball joint play. 
but it can be done with two guys. So what fails ball joints and tie rods? Well, typically an accident, but almost like the bearings, when you strike these against a curb by hitting the wheel against something or another car or competitor, you actually can dent the receiver that the ball goes in for this ball joint or tie rod. Once you create a divot in these, additional rotation past that divot will wear out the surface of the ball joint more quickly and that will end up with a joint that's sloppy and has end play. Bushings. Most of your links that don't have a joint like a ball joint or tie rod will have bushings of some kind or another. Bushings in most OEM applications are made from rubber like this one here. In our series, you're allowed to change out rubber joints or bushings for polyurethane bushings. Comparing rubber, which is very flexible, to polyurethane, which is not, you can see that the polyurethane is an advantage in reducing compliance. So on this control arm, reduction in compliance could lead to a reduction in camber loss. And like we spoke about earlier, same thing applies to sway bars and other systems in the car where the end of the joint can actually move and cause some kind of geometry or rate change. How do you tell if your bushings are bad? Well, some of them are obvious. If they get old enough to actually get cracks in them, you can also sometimes notice when you're driving that you actually feel like suspension is moving or you have issues controlling the wheel. The car wants to wander at high speed. Those generally mean that you have either control arm bushings that are bad or some kind of other lateral link bushing that's bad. For poly bushings, something you have to watch for is poly bushings generally have an inner steel shaft that they rotate about. Compared to rubber bushings, which are usually molded with the steel inside of them, there's actually a bearing surface that has to ride from poly bushings. If you start to lose lubrication in that, in that joint between the steel sleeve and the poly bushing, you will quickly wear away the poly, creating play and, and, and lash. The only way to really find that though is to take the car apart. So my suggestion would be if you have poly bushings, once a year you need to disassemble your suspension and by hand check that each insert actually has the correct amount of lash or end play in each joint and replace anything that you have concerns over. It is also very important when you're using poly bushings to use the right lubrication. Rubber bushings generally, because they're molded in with the steel piece inside, don't need lubrication. Poly bushings do, but you should not use petroleum-based lubricants on poly bushings. Either use the lubricant that comes with the poly bushing, or if that's not available, use a silicone-based grease. You can usually find these in the aisle of most parts stores advertised as synthetic or silicone-based brake grease. The last kind of bushing material, Delrin. Delrin itself is actually very hard. Some cars have kits they offer bushings in Delrin. For most you have to make it yourself. And I would recommend only using Delrin in applications where you absolutely need it. Again, because you'll have to make it again. If you must replace it on your own, you can't just buy it. And also because Delrin can crack and it's more prone to cracking than softer polys that are typically found in most of the bushings you buy from online stores. You're able through changing out your bushings to actually tune the bushing stiffness. Now for most joints you just don't want any compliance whatsoever but in some specific applications you do actually want to tune up a specific stiffness. Now for this particular joint if we found that we wanted to make it softer, you can actually draw holes in it, maintain the same material, and that'll make it softer. As we spoke about earlier in the sway bar section, in some sway bar end links, it's actually desirable to make the bushing stiffer. And you can do that by reducing the actual size of the bushing, either cutting it in half or changing the OD or the ID. But the less material you have, the stiffer it will actually become. And a great example of that is front anti roll bars that have pancake style end links where the bushing is in between two washers making the poly bushings thinner will make the stiffness greater.
So let's say you're driving your car in the middle of a race. How do you know that you failed your bushings and it's potentially bad enough for you to stop? Well, common symptoms of failed bushings and sometimes joints are going to be a loss of camber control, which you will feel is dartiness when the car is going straight, a loss of toe control, which you'll feel as hunting on the steering wheel. The driver will have to constantly make corrections mid-corner to keep the car going straight. On some cars, if you fail bushings in the anti-roll system, you actually will feel it as slop. The car will feel like it rolls a lot initially and then the roll rate slows down. Or you'll even hear a clunking as you go through turns left to right. Hope you guys have learned something about bushings, hubs, and bearings. Make sure you hit that like button, subscribe, and thanks for watching.